Thank you for watching today's sermon from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... You may remain seated. Our sermon text is our first lesson from Genesis chapter 3, and I'll be reading through that lesson during the course of the sermon. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear victors over sin and death, through faith in our champion, Jesus Christ. The word Genesis means beginning. That's why the video game company Sega picked that name Genesis to be their first video game system. That's also why NASA, when they launched a satellite back in 2001 that was supposed to go back and take a look and find out the beginnings of our solar system supposedly billions of years ago, they ironically named that satellite Genesis. But the word Genesis is probably best known as the title for the first book of the Bible. And that title is very appropriate. After all, the first words of the book of Genesis are in the beginning. But the entire book of Genesis tells us about beginnings. It tells us the beginnings of all creation, the beginnings of human life, the beginning of marriage, the beginning of languages, the beginning of the people of Israel. And even the beginning of things like metallurgy and music and agriculture. But most importantly, the book of Genesis tells us about the beginnings of sin, death, and the promise of our Savior, as we see today in our text. The entire Bible is one big, long, true story from start to finish, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. Those books are really just the first and the last chapters of the same true story, the true story of our eternal salvation. The Bible tells us about us. Now, you and I come in very close to the end of the story, the very last chapters, in fact, but our sermon text for this morning takes us all the way back to Genesis, to the beginnings of the story of our salvation, the very first chapters in the Garden of Eden. And these chapters of the story of our salvation are incredibly important. I had the opportunity, because we didn't have a Thursday night service this past week, to go and see a movie that's been out in the movie theaters a little bit recently called Is Genesis History? And I know a few of there, I saw a few of you there, and I hope more of you got to see that movie too. I'd highly recommend it. It was a great movie and a great encouragement for our faith that science does not disprove what God says in Genesis. Not that we base our faith on scientific facts because those can change. The Word of God does not. And I hope that in the future we can get a hold of that movie and, and watch it together and talk about it because it is good encouragement for us in our faith. And the, the men who were involved in the making of that movie sat down for a chat and talked about the importance of the book of Genesis. If we allow critics to tear apart the first chapter of the Bible where we see the origins of sin and salvation, where we see the promise of God first take place that he's going to send us a Savior, we allow them to rip out any chapter of the Bible and any part of our salvation, if not the whole thing. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans points back to the book of Genesis and what happened there in the garden to show that Jesus just like Adam did a real and very important and effectual thing for all of the world. And if Adam is just a myth, then Jesus' salvation for us would just be a myth too. So today we turn back to this all-important book, the first chapters of God's plan of salvation for us. And we see how God showed his love to the crown of his creation. Adam and Eve were God's special creatures. Everything that he made, he actually made for them. From the very first day of creation week, on Sunday of creation week, when he created light, to Friday when he finally created Adam and his wife Eve, everything that God made in all of creation was a gift of love to his 
human beings. And he made Adam and Eve in a very special way, different from the entire rest of creation. He made them like him in his image. He made them perfect, giving them a perfect will, perfect emotions, and perfect intellect. So not only did they know what to do that was right and good, but they had the ability to do it and even rejoiced to do it perfectly. God gave them a beautiful home to live in. There in the Garden of Eden, he planted all sorts of fruit trees and vegetables for them to eat. They had everything that they needed there, and God even gave them a purpose, a reason for existing, that they would represent him and his kind and loving care as they took care of that garden. And they would be able to do it just like their perfect creator because they were in his image. And God gave Adam and Eve, this perfect man and woman, one command for them to show in a special way their love and thanks to him for all that he had done. He made one tree different from the rest and put it there in the middle of the garden and he said to Adam and Eve, or specifically to Adam, I want you to to treat this tree special and sacred. I want you not to eat from this one tree. I've given you everything that you need. Simply do not eat from this one tree as a way of showing your love and thanks to me. God said, You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. The words of our text happen one day as Eve was near that tree and bumped into a talking snake. The devil, of course, was using that snake to try to end Adam and Eve's happy relationship with the Lord, the God of heaven and earth. He was trying to take Adam and Eve away from the eternal life that God had planned for them and bring them to eternal death with the devil. We Read these verses from our text, which are printed for you there in your bulletins. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Ooh, that devil's sneaky, isn't he? He knows God's word. And he was able to use it against Eve to tempt her to doubt God's love. The devil used God's word even to try to tempt Jesus in our gospel lesson. After all that God had done for Adam and Eve, And all that he had given them, the devil was able to point to one command that God had given and make Eve think that God was holding out on her. The devil made Eve think that if God was keeping something away from her, he must not really love her the way that he promised he does. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, the devil told her. And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. God's holding back. He's keeping you from something that should be yours. So Eve wanted something for herself that God said she should not have. And she felt like God had no right to withhold something for her that she wanted. She didn't realize, as we often do not realize, that when God keeps something back from his beloved children or causes or allows something painful in our lives, he does so for our good and out of love for us. So Eve, falling into the devil's temptation, took some of the fruit and ate it, gave some to her husband Adam who was right there with her. He ate it too. And so 100% of the entire human race fell victim to the devil's temptations and earned God's wrath for sin. But as I said earlier, Genesis tells us not just about Adam and Eve, but about us. Genesis tells us our beginnings, the beginning of our human race and the beginning of our sin. 
The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And so in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Adam and Eve were something like our, our 200 times great-grandparents. And you and I inherited from them the mess that they created that day. Each and every one of us was born sinners, and different from the way that God made us to be, the way that God made Adam and Eve to be. He made them perfect. We were born sinful. He made them to love and serve him, but we by nature serve only ourselves, as Eve did that day. He made them to live forever, but because we're sinful, just like they became, you and I will one day die, like they did. It's a sure thing for every single one of us. Death came to all people because all sinned. They swallowed the devil's lie. You will not surely die. But the rest of the story shows the devil's lie for what it is. A trail of death follows Adam and Eve through the rest of the book of Genesis, through the rest of the entire Bible, through the rest of history. Even if you continue reading into the next chapter, sure, Adam lived to be 930 years, but he died. And his son after him, Seth, he died. And his son, he died. And his son, he died. It's like a funeral bell tolling to show us that death came to all people. And even the first generation, right after Adam and Eve, what does Adam and Eve's firstborn son, Cain, do? In a jealous rage, he kills his brother Abel. Death, in a horrible way, comes to all people through Adam and Eve because all of us fall into the devil's trap and sin. The devil's temptations against Eve sound familiar, don't they? He's still up to the same tricks as he was back in the beginning. He plants the seeds of doubt in our heart. Did God really say? Does God really mean that you shouldn't do that? As Christians, we know what the will of God for us is, just like Eve did. She knew God's commands. And yet we try to justify breaking the law that we know by saying that if God truly cared about me, he would give me an exception. He would let me off the hook. He would say it's okay. He would want us to have what we think and what we want is best. Certainly God wants us to have some fun, doesn't he? He doesn't want his Christians to be boring people. I'm not hurting anyone. Why would God care? Following God's command is, is so hard to do it all the time. Surely it's okay if I mess up just a few times. If I take a break from following God's commands so strictly, how can he expect me to, to keep my thoughts clean as well as my words and actions? How can God expect me to, to love every one of my neighbors and even my enemies? You know, life would be so much easier if we didn't have all of these pesky rules. The devil tempts us too. The same way he tempted Eve and Adam the devil tempts us to believe that God's commands, rather than being a loving command to us, that God's commands are holding us back and keeping us from the joy that we think should be ours. And we fall, as Eve did, when we doubt that everything that God has done for us is for our good. He tells us that it is. And he tells us that he works in love in everything that happens to us. We may try to blame Adam and Eve for bringing this curse on us. It's all of their fault. If we had had a chance, it would all be different. But God tells us in his word that we don't die because of their sins. We die because of our own. The soul who sins is the one who will die, God tells us in the book of Ezekiel. And the proof is in the pudding. All of Adam and Eve's children are sinners. All of us will surely die. Death proves that every one of us is sinful. Let's read a little bit more of our text. Verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? 
Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Adam and Eve demonstrated their sinfulness right away. They were suddenly embarrassed about their bodies, the bodies that God had given them. And because of their sinful thoughts, they sought to, to cover up the bodies that God had given them. They made flimsy fig leaf coverings for themselves. And when God came looking for them in the garden to walk with them and talk with them, they went and hid from the one who knows and sees all things. Adam and Eve deserved for God to, to come to them angry and destroy them for their sins, for breaking his commands. But he didn't. The Lord continues instead to show them his love and his compassion. Even though they had disobeyed him and hated him because of his holiness, they were afraid of him. They had broken his relationship. They were running away and hiding. And still God came to them in the garden and gave them a chance to repent. He called out to Adam first because God had given the command to him, because God had expected him to be the leader in his family. Adam had not been a good leader that day, and he continues to be a poor leader when the Lord calls him to repentance. He points the finger not at himself and takes the blame. He points the finger at his wife and at God or, or anywhere else. He didn't want to take the blame himself. The woman that you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. And Eve doesn't do much better. She directs the blame away from herself and towards the devil. He tempted me. How much different would it have been if Adam and Eve had done what God wanted and repented for their sin? But God, rather than smashing them to bits for their sin, for their unwillingness to repent, instead he follows Eve's finger pointing at the devil and turns to the devil and delivers a message to the snake. Again, showing his love to Adam and Eve. He cursed that snake and the devil for what they had done to the crown of his creation. The devil would be dealt one fatal crushing blow by one of Eve's descendants. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Rather than destroy Adam and Eve there in the garden and start over and try again with a new humanity because we had all become corrupt, God chose instead to rescue us simply because of his love. The words of this curse against the devil are the first time that God promises to send a Savior to save us from our sins. And the rest of the Bible tells us what happened throughout history because of that promise. The Old Testament tells us how God kept that promise alive down from generation to generation until the time passed for that right offspring of the woman to come. And as time got closer, God revealed more and more about what the Savior was going to be like through his prophets. But ever since the promise was made, believers have looked back to the Garden of Eden and to this passage of Genesis 3.15 as the first hope, the first promise of our salvation. And God made good on his promise. He does not disappoint us. Thousands of years later, Jesus came as the offspring of the woman. He was born without the corruption, without the sin that Adam and Eve brought into this world. He was brought he came perfect in every way as the mighty Son of God, conceived in, e in Mary by the Holy Spirit. We look back to Genesis 3.15 every Christmas to remember that Jesus came as the fulfillment of that first promise. And the Apostle John reminds us, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. In our Gospel lesson this morning, the devil came and tempted Jesus as he had done to Eve in the garden. But Jesus didn't give in, not even for a moment. 
He fought the devil's temptations with the word of God like Eve should have done and like we should do each and every day. But where we fall, where we fail and fall into sin and temptation, Jesus was the victor on every account. He defeated the devil's temptations and spurned him away, living the perfect life for us in our place. And Jesus wasn't just tempted three times. The devil didn't leave him permanently. The devil continued to tempt Jesus throughout his life. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, and yet was without sin. What we couldn't do, he lived perfectly in our place without sin, and he did it for us. But just because Jesus was safe from sin and God's condemnation didn't mean that we were safe. We needed to be rescued from the devil's clutches that held us under God's wrath for our sin. So Jesus took the punishment that we deserved. He took God's wrath for us and suffered for us on the cross. Certainly the devil did bite Jesus' heel. Jesus suffered terribly for the punishment that we deserved. The punishment cost God, his very own son, But by his suffering and death on the cross, Jesus broke the power of the devil over us. He earned forgiveness for the sins of the entire world and he gave his righteousness and perfection to us sinners so that we could live forever with him in heaven like God planned for us from the beginning. Jesus dealt that final crushing blow to the devil there on Mount Calvary on Good Friday when he suffered and died and showed that he was victor over sin and death by rising again from the grave On Easter Sunday morning, he assures us by his life that we will also rise again and defeat death that once held all of us. I mentioned earlier that the Bible is our story from start to finish, the story of our salvation. The story continues even after Jesus' death and resurrection. Millions of people all over the world come to believe in Jesus, their Savior, as they hear how he defeated the devil. And we're just a handful, a small handful of that group. The Bible tells us that more and more people will come to know Jesus as their Savior until the end of the world comes. And on that day, our Savior, our champion, will return and crush the devil in one final time, casting him forever into the fiery pit of hell where he will suffer eternally for his Rebellion against the Lord. There will be no escape for the devil. He will not rule and rejoice in his position in hell. He will be punished forever and not be able to escape and never be able to touch God's people again. Jesus is that promised offspring of the woman, our champion over sin, death, and hell, and the guarantee of our eternal life. Amen. Please stand. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at the following times. Like us on Facebook or visit our website for audio and video sermons or to find out more about our congregation. God bless your week in the Lord.